this time on Broad and High. Check out the new wing at the Columbus Museum of Art. When you come to visit, what you're going to see is a contemporary collection you did not know we had. Some city structures get a playful makeover. And six word stories from Katzinger's Deli. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome back to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Manicky. The new wing at the Columbus Museum of Art opened last month with great fanfare. The museum now has an extra 50,000 square feet of space, and here's your chance to see what's inside. When you come to visit, what you're going to see is a contemporary collection you did not know we had. The barrel is back, and after 10 years, it has its own new home. When you go in it, and I think this is something people don't always realize, when you go in it, you're actually in the work of art because of the walls, the interior walls are even specced by the artists. They sort of bow in to make it, you know, psychologically when you're in there, you actually feel that the room is kind of closing in a little bit at, because the whole point of the piece is for you to be thoughtful about the weight of all of us on the environment. Uh, another beloved piece is um, Nocturne Navigator, known fondly as the Blue Lady, uh, by Alison Saar. And it's always been in Derby Court. And now it's being seen the way the artist meant it to be seen. When it was in Derby Court, uh, which is a beautiful light-filled space, but it is a light-filled space. And that is a problem for the work because it's actually internally illuminated. So by enclosing it in a, its own alcove, you can really see the, the pinpoint holes that represent the constellations of the stars. We knew there was one piece needed to be hung in the uh, lobby, in, in the atrium lobby, and it is uh, Lino's masterwork. We've owned it for a few years. We used to hang it, people remember it in Gallery 5, I think, and it hung in a low lit space and it filled up the gallery. So here you see it skied up and uh, you know up close to the ceiling, flooded with light. I think one work in the show that will really get people's attention is a piece called Doorway by Lucas Samaras. This is a mirrored box and inside that large 10 foot by 12 foot box there is another mirrored box. When you peer inside of it, you see an endless series of reflections. It's a really wonderful, immersive experience, even though you're standing outside of the piece. I think there's such a variety of experiences that are now available at the Columbus Museum of Art. Josiah McElhinney's Three Screens for Looking at Abstraction, which is an installation of three large uh, structures that are made out of mirrors and projection cloth and we have these digital projectors that are showing films onto these screens. So there is this wonderful confounding play of surfaces, um, what is appearance, what is reality. There hasn't been a retrospective of Paul Feely's work since 1968. So this is in some ways a kind of rediscovery of Feely's work. He taught at uh, Bennington College in Vermont and he taught painting from 1939 until his death in 1966. The exhibition begins in 1954, which is really where, where Paul Feely's mature work begins and he turned to, turned to abstraction in the early 1950s and started making a series of works which have these large colored fields of paint which really sometimes you see you, sometimes you see the blue sometimes you see the red becomes the dominant image or the figure in the in the painting so sometimes a particular work might be uh, a spinal column sometimes you will see a row of teeth 
Pace Gallery today is a very important commercial art gallery with eight different locations on three different continents. It is a little known fact that between 1965 and 1982 there was Pace Gallery in Columbus which was um, run by Mrs. Eva Glimpscher who is the mother of the founder of Pace Gallery, Arnie Glimpscher. We reconstructed the history of shows at Pace Columbus uh, through the archives of the Columbus Dispatch. I want people to take a new look at us, a fresh look at us. I, I think we've, you know, we've been here since 1878 and I think we are a wonderful art museum, but I think the new us is even greater and more interesting and fun and I want people to come and give us a try. The Columbus Museum of Art is open every day except Mondays and holidays, and they're free on Sundays. Find them online at columbusmuseum.org. It's time for our next installment of Artifacts. This is where we delve into some of the hidden curiosities at the Ohio History Center. Curator Cliff Eckel recently showed me some debris from the USS Shenandoah, which was a rigid airship made by the U.S. Navy that crashed over Noble County in 1925. Okay, Cliff, tell me what we're looking at. It looks like a fragment of something. Yeah, these are fragments from the USS Shenandoah, which was the first rigid airship built in the United States in 1923, and she served in the United States Navy. So at this time, what was the purpose of an airship? Was it for transportation, for entertainment? Why were they around, especially with airplanes on the rise? Well, the Shenandoah was built for the United States Navy, and the idea behind the airships was that it was supposed to provide reconnaissance for the fleet and help find the enemy and uh, provide the fleet with information. And in 1925, in September, she was sent on a publicity tour and she was going to tour uh, some of the state fairs and other county fairs in the Midwest. Early on the morning of September 3rd, uh, when they were flying over eastern Ohio, they hit a severe storm squall, which caused the aircraft to break apart. And uh, the control gondola, where the captain and seven crew members it was stripped away from the aircraft and they crashed and uh, none of them survived. It had a crew, normally a crew of 41, there were 43 aboard when she crashed. Uh, 14 died during the crash, but 29 survived because the uh, three sections that still contained it, some of the uh, helium gas bags uh, came down fairly gently. Well, this is part of the framework that uh, uh, provided the structure, the rigid structure, to uh, the dirigible. Uh, the framework is made of duralumin, which is made of aluminum, uh, copper, and magnesium. And, uh, but you can see, uh, shows the, right, the damage the where, where it was ripped apart. Is it really heavy or light, or how did they? It's very lightweight. Is it? Can I pick it up? Sure. Oh my gosh, it's extremely light. And this is uh, something from the interior of the ship. These were from one of the gla gas bladders that held the helium that provided buoyancy okay. to the airship. And uh, it was made from the intestines of cattle. But at the time, it was the most impermeable material they knew how to make so that would keep the gas in. And this is a paper cup from the crash site. Huh, look at that. Uh, the crash site is in uh, uh, Noble County, not too far from uh, Caldwell. Okay. And, uh, the crash site of the largest section is right near I-77, and you uh, can see the crash site from the freeway, and it's marked with uh, cement blocks. Since 2006, Larry Smith has been encouraging people to share moving and insightful stories in just six words. And this year, he brought his project to Columbus. He recently invited us to a Six in the City meetup at Katzinger's Deli in German Village.
Finding in Columbus friends, strength, myself. Columbus again, five's a charm. <laughs> I moved here five times. <laughs> moved for work and found love. Aww. Columbus, not just about Buckeyes anymore. My six word story, no cows, really, zero cows. <laughs> Uh, the story of the Six Word Memoir Project really starts uh, with a great storyteller, which was my grandfather, who everyone called Smitty. So one day I said, Smitty, tell me your story start from the beginning. And that day he said, my story? Who would be interested in that? Which was surprising, but in a way not. Because many of us don't think we have a story worth retelling. That our lives are too ordinary or unexceptional. But of course we all do. At some point I launched something called the Six Word Memoir Project. My way, a simple way I thought, for anyone to share a life story in exactly six words. Why six? As the story goes, Hemingway was once challenged to write a whole novel in just six words. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. And so I said, well, let's give the Hemingway legend a personal twist. Called it the Six Word Memoir, and within days we had 10 and 15,000 six word memoirs. So what if we took everything I've seen happen in six words that's worked well and that I love and moved it through a city, like in a somewhat organized way? So what a great place to launch Six of the City Columbus and figure out our identity six words at a time from hopefully thousands of people. And what we're going to do tonight is what you do at Kassinger's. You eat and you tell stories. So tonight, Diane Warren is going to kick things off with her six word story on Kassinger's. This started actually when I was a junior in high school in 1964 and some friends and I went to spend spring break at uh, Miami Beach. We stayed in this kind of dive motel called the Golden Sands and across the street from the Golden Sands is a palatial deli called Pumpernick's. So we go over there to Pumpernick's for a snack and I order the corned beef hash and this waitress brings this oval platter that's just got this beautifully scented, beautiful to look at corned beef hash. So every day, here we go, we got seven days here, right? And every day, my friends are going out the back door to the beach, and I'm going across the street to Pumpernick's. And so when I was telling Larry about this, and he said, Miami Beach made you do it. And I said, yes, Miami Beach made me do it. But then when I thought deeper about it, I realized what the six words really are, or the additional six words are, is that corned beef hash changed my life. <laughs> what a great place to launch Six of the City Columbus and figure out our identity six words at a time from hopefully thousands of people. What's your story in just six words? Learn how you can play along by visiting sixwordmemoirs.com or finding them on social media. Parking booths don't usually turn heads, but some new playful structures in downtown Columbus have gotten an artful makeover. It's all part of a public art project that challenges you to think of new uses for everyday spaces. Public art, through its surprise, through its originality, through its location, can get people to think about spaces in new ways. The idea from the beginning is that this would be not just uh, one or two booths, that, that, that it would be the, the suite of booths we've been calling it that would have impact, um, impact locally because they would be within walking distance within the core downtown. And we believe impact nationally because nobody else is doing this. Nobody is looking at the most mundane spots in the city and micro building with the most mundane function and doing something adventuresome with it. We were really interested in a kind of sense of whimsy that could be created. Uh, through the booth. Obviously you don't think about a parking booth as being a piece of architecture. Um, so we thought about the kind of whimsical quality that could be instilled through the design. So obviously a garden is also something that you usually don't see within a sea of asphalt. 
Um, so that was kind of contributing to the sense of inspiration that we hoped this place would create. We actually met with some of the attendants and we learned that what they do actually involves um, a lot more tools than what we thought. And so the design really tried to accommodate everything that they need to do their job. When we conceived this, I was thinking about the, I, and encouraged the architects to think about how it's going to change the physical working conditions, but then also what it's like to work in a place that is unique and that in a way is your home. Even if you have an office cubicle, you usually try to make it somehow yours, you know, but this is, this is special. We hope that it's something that they take pride in and, and are excited about coming to work in this instead of in a little box. When a museum's collection contains works of art that are hundreds or even thousands of years old, sometimes a little repair work is needed. Painted around 1585, El Greco's The Penitent Magdalene recently underwent restoration in Kansas City, Missouri. It's a delicate and time-consuming process that will give a fresh look to an old master. The painting entered the collection in 1930. Uh, 1930 is the first year that uh, the Nelson was collecting artwork. They had people over in Europe buying art and they number the paintings according to when they enter the collection. So this one, purchased in 1930, was the 35th work of art that was put into Nelson Atkins Museum's collection. So it was an important work to be added. They had a laundry list, and the laundry list was a good example of all the masters. So they wanted a Rembrandt, they, you know, they, they fell into a Caravaggio, they wanted a Titian, uh, they wanted a Bronzino, they wanted representations of all of these important artists. So when this came along as the 35th artwork, and it was a very strong El Greco, it was an easy choice. It treats a religious subject with clarity and simplicity, and it really allows you to focus on her moment of seeing Christ. The Penitent Magdalene is not only a jewel of the Nelson Atkins collection, it's internationally recognized as one of the finest examples of El Greco's work. And because of that, it was cordially invited to participate in an exhibition that commemorated the 400th anniversary of the master's death in his adopted hometown of Toledo, Spain. But before she could make the 4,600-mile journey, Scott had to embark on one of the most challenging restorations of his career. We're now looking at the painting with ultraviolet light, a black light. And what that does is it shows up the previous restoration that's on the painting will fluoresce a dark color. And so it makes it easier for us to see it. When you look at her arm, it should be a very smooth arm, and it's not. All of these dark areas are areas of repaint. And when I clean the painting, all of that old restoration will come off and I'll be able to see the actual damage that's on the painting. Then what I'll do is I'll rebuild that with my own paints so that her flesh will look smooth and continuous. Now I did find when I did my test cleanings that underneath the varnish and underneath the uh, repaint, there's something else on the surface that gets gummy. And I, it's, I have to sort of swell it with the solvent and I have to kind of smear it off and kind of pick it off. I don't know what that is. This may be my most complicated treatment to date. El Greco's first brushstroke on this canvas was in 1580. And since then, it has endured countless attempts at preservation and often with materials that did more harm than good. They didn't have the chemicals that we have. And so to dis dissolve this discoloration and this varnish, they sometimes even spread lye on the painting, really caustic material, and even put it in the sun to have that bake and, and dissolve off this discoloration. Then they wipe that off and oh. When you see damage to a masterpiece, it is painful. 
when you're restoring something, you're, you and it are one. I mean, because you're, you're responsible for bringing it back to its best appearance, the way that El Greco painted it in this case. After removing the last remnant of past restorations, Scott's task is to now bridge the islands of original paint. The next step is for me to apply the first coat of varnish. And the reason I do that is to saturate the colors. I use a natural resin varnish uh, that has the most saturating capabilities. Uh, the same kind of varnish that El Greco might have used, but with modern additions to keep it uh, from discoloring over time. And then I'll begin the in-painting. You look closely, there are lots of dark dots. And that's where original paint's been skinned off of the actual top of the canvas weave. And I'll mix my, my paints and I'll put my dot of white right where that dot of black is. And I do that over every single little dot, even the tiny ones. Mixing the colors to match the surrounding area at each point where I put the in painting. And then, you know, his very quick and, and lucid brushwork will be apparent. I'll be doing that in very good natural light. And depending if it's a cloudy day, I can't work. It has to be good lighting conditions for me to see these colors. And the human eye is the only thing that can match these colors. Because sometimes the colors are layers of transparent over opaque. Those kinds of issues can't be perceived by a computer. The human eye is just more capable at matching the way that the artist uh, intended it to look. It's really a thrill to bring it back. It looks so bad now, but I, I see only promise in this painting. When it's wet up, I can see the genius in different places that are, that are fractured and damaged and compromised. But I know through the end painting that I'll be able to unify his work and, and bring back that genius. We aim for everything to be reversible. And the paints that I use, anyone could come in 100 years from now using a very weak solvent and take that off. It's very easy for them to get back to the original now that I've brought it to this point. It takes quite a bit of patience, but when you're in painting and the light is good and you're matching the colors, you often get lost in it. It does require patience, but you just are doing it and time goes by quickly. Your mind can wander and you know, you're know you just, uh, just entranced with it. As Scott's final brushstrokes cleave with El Greco's original intention, his endeavor that has taken over a year to complete is sealed with coats of lacquer and wheeled off for a homecoming centuries in the making. The focus of this exhibition in Toledo was understanding work by El Greco in his hand and work by his workshop, work by followers of El Greco and even further down the line. And so they were very interested in our penitent Magdalene. They used this as a real center point in the show because this is clearly completely by El Greco's hand and then they had other penitent Magdalens that were further down the line, and, and, and visitors to the show could see the differences themselves and learn about El Greco's technique. It's really part of our mission to be able to share our collection, not just with our visitors here in Kansas City or even within the United States, but to share our collection really with a worldwide audience. We knew that it needed treatment for quite some time, so for us to be able to do this conservation work, to know that when we sent the painting there, that it's the best example that it can possibly be of our painting is really important and really special to us. After months abroad, the penitent Magdalene returned home to once again adorn the Nelson Atkins hallowed walls. And after a thorough inspection, she joined one of Scott's past restorations, the Trinitarian Friar, marking the first time in museum history that the two El Grecos have hung side by side. I just love it, and uh, I have such a kinship with it now. I feel like it's my painting. I mean, I don't own it, but I own a, a sort of a, an area of it. I share a bond, 
And so when I come up to it in the gallery, I just, we're friends and we're back together again, you know, and I, that's really kind of a, a thrill. And since I've been here a long time and have restored many of our really great paintings, I've got a lot of friends here. <laughs> That's our show. To see all of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. We're closing today's show with the sounds of the Columbus-based group Beyond Pluto in a track off their latest album, Watch It Explode. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on Broad and High. Everything that's in front of me It's time to clear my pride and jealousy Oh, 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 oh. give it Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council Supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com and by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences.